Willie Dry resides in Wilmington, but he's lived in Plymouth for 20 years, and he still has a home in Plymouth. Um, he has authored three books and is now working on his fourth book and is a contributing editor for the National Geographic News. He uh, is chair of the Washington County Waterways Commission, and he's worked in the last couple of years to revitalize the Roanoke River Lighthouse in the museum in Plymouth. And uh, for that, he was awarded the 2021 Outer Banks Lighthouse Society Roanoke River Lighthouse Award, PRISM Award. And so um, we uh, welcome Willie and this talk that he's going to give today, it's going to be very fascinating. Um, I heard some of it on Friday when we went through a trial run. So, Willie, the the floor is yours now. Okay. Well, thank you, thank you, Ben. I appreciate that and appreciate the introduction. And um, um, I'm still enjoying that uh, that Lighthouse Award. Uh, it's always nice to be recognized for what you're trying to do. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, today about the Roanoke River and Albemarle Sound lighthouses. Uh, the pictures that you see, the pictures that you see on your screen there, does not show a Roanoke River uh, keeper. I just liked it because it was so very much of the period that I'm going to be talking about. That's uh, uh, Emmanuel Lewick, who was keeper of the um, Sand Island Lighthouse in uh, on Lake Superior in, in Wisconsin. And the quote that you see on your screen there, when a woman marries a lighthouse keeper, she gives up everything else in the world. Uh, that comment was by Cecilia Carlson McLean, who was the wife of another Lake Superior uh, lighthouse keeper in, uh, in Minnesota, on Raspberry, Raspberry Island, Minnesota. Um, <clears throat> keepers in the larger cities, uh, such as Boston and New York and Charleston and Savannah, um, could lead something resembling a normal life, but so many of the lighthouse stations were way out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, the, the people who, who lived there and worked there were often quite isolated for long periods of time. And after a while, uh, it should, it certainly did begin uh, to work on you a little bit. Um, the story of the Roanoke River Lighthouse it begins with the Dismal Swamp Canal. Um, northeastern North Carolina's coastline is uh, kind of unusual in that uh, it doesn't allow deep water harbors uh, that would accommodate ocean going ships. So that region's economic development was hindered. Uh, George Washington is said to have suggested in 1763 that a canal should be dug to connect the Albemarle Sound with the Chesapeake Bay. And you can see on the map inset there uh, where, this, where this canal is. Um, work started in 1793, and um, it was dug by enslaved laborers uh, through 22 miles of, of swamp. I mean, just take a moment to think about that, um, the conditions that those men worked under, uh, water moccasins, leeches, mosquitoes, extreme heat. It was just an extremely unpleasant uh, job to, to have to do. Um, it was completed in 1805, and when it was completed, it did link the, the sound and the bay. Um, and it opened um, northeastern North Carolina to maritime commerce, and it, uh, it did uh, spark an increase in maritime traffic. Um, <clears throat> Plymouth benefited uh, greatly from, from the canal, um, uh, especially when steamboats appeared on the Roanoke River around 1820. Um, goods could be shipped on shallow drafts, flat bottom boats uh, for just about the entire length of the river uh, brought to Plymouth. They could be unloaded there and loaded onto barges and the uh, steamboats would tow them down the river and out into the Albemarle Sound, across the Sound, and uh, past Elizabeth City and up the canal to Norfolk. And um, in Norfolk, uh, of course, had a deep water harbor, and that opened up the markets uh, of the world uh, to northeastern North Carolina, and it did make a big difference in the region's development. And it made such a big difference that in 1831, 
uh, the mayor, the Congress decided that a navigation aid was needed at the mouth of the Roanoke um, to accommodate uh, all of this, this new traffic. So they authorized uh, construction of the Roanoke River light ship. <clears throat> uh, the ship was built by the Horatio Williams Company in Elizabeth City. It went on station in 1835. Um, it served, uh, it was in use until uh, the outbreak of the Civil War um, in 1861. North Carolina was uh, among the last states to leave the Union when the war broke out. North Carolina and Tennessee were the last two to leave. And uh, when North Carolina departed in May of 1861, um, the following month, uh, the Confederate government ordered that the light ship be removed from the Roanoke River and uh, fr from the Albemarle Sound and towed upriver to uh, Williamston, which is about 20 miles upriver. Um, Plymouth changed hands. There was a lot of fierce fighting in Plymouth. Plymouth changed hands several times during the war. 1864. When, uh, when the Union was in control of Plymouth, uh, the Roanoke River light ship was uh, towed downriver from Williamston and sunk in a channel in the Sound in an effort to um, obstruct Confederate warships from moving up and down um, the river. And so that was pretty much the end of, of the light ship. <clears throat> um, when, now, I want to tell you a little bit about the operation of the ship. You see there at the top of that mast, um, that is the beacon. Um, and the beacon could be, uh, was raised and lowered by a means of pulleys. The, that double mast there that you see is uh, nearly identical to the structure that was used on the guillotine in France, uh, became infamous during the French Revolution. It's a very similar construction. Uh, every morning, the lighthouse keepers would lower the beacon. They would extinguish the flame, uh, the, 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 the um, they would extinguish the flame, they would clean the light and refuel it. And um, at sundown, they would uh, raise the beacon at, or they would light the beacon and then raise it back up into position. Um, this configuration of the light ship, there's a little bit of speculation there, but it is uh, informed speculation. Uh, there are no known uh, sketches um, of the light ship um, but I did find a copy of the original construction contract um, for the light ship. Uh, I found it in the files at Fort Fisher State Park. Now, how in the world it ended up there, I have no idea. But uh, I did find a copy there, and the, the contract um, included a detailed description of the ship uh, and its dimensions and a detailed uh, description of all of its fixtures, and including this um, kind of unique uh, mast for raising and lowering the light. And I also uh, got a drawing of a light ship from that period from the Webb Institute of Naval Architecture on Long Island. They, they had a little bit of it. They did not have a, a, a picture of the Roanoke River light ship, but they did have a, a sketch of kind of a, a standard uh, light ship from that period. And I talked to two Coast Guard historians, got their input about how the ship probably appeared. And uh, the model was built by, um, by David Goble of Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, I think he did a wonderful job on it. Um, it is now in display, uh, on display in the lighthouse, uh, the replica lighthouse in Plymouth. And uh, next time y'all are passing by, I invite you to stop in and take a look at it. I think it's uh, a very interesting piece of work. <laughs> After the war ended, the Civil War ended, uh, the federal government wanted to restart uh, maritime commerce um, on the Roanoke. <clears throat> so they authorized uh, the construction of a lighthouse this time, not a light ship, a lighthouse. And on your screen there, you see the first and the third Roanoke River Lighthouses. Obvious question, where's the second Roanoke River Lighthouse? Well, I'll explain that in a minute. It had a very uh, brief and interesting history. Um, <clears throat> the first lighthouse, the one on your left there, that's the replica. Uh, it was built from the original plans and um, 
So that is an exact copy of the lighthouse with, of course, the exception that the original lighthouse didn't have electricity and air conditioning. Um, but otherwise, this is an identical copy of the 1867 lighthouse. That lighthouse went on station on January 1st, um, 1867, and it burned down on March 21st, 1885. I have never been able to find um, a cause of that fire, but there were very many, there were many flammable materials uh, that were aboard a lighthouse. And so if a fire got started and got even a little bit out of control, it was going to be a very dangerous uh, situation. And so I have to assume um, that that is, that's what happened. Um, the uh, U.S. Lighthouse Service annual report for 1885, 1884-85 does not mention the cause of the fire. It does mention that the lighthouse burned down, but it didn't mention the cause. The second Roanoke River Lighthouse um, went on station not long after the first lighthouse burned. The um, federal government considered the lighthouse at the Roanoke River to be very important, and they did not want to have any delay in replacing it. Um, these little river lighthouses were prefabricated uh, in Baltimore, and uh, they were put on a barge and towed down to wherever they were going to be established and, and, and uh, moved onto the platforms. And the at the time of the fire uh, that destroyed the 1867 lighthouse, uh, the lighthouse service had uh, prepared a new lighthouse that was supposed to go on station at Roanoke Marshes, uh, just off of Manio. But because of the importance of the Roanoke River light, they decided to um, redirect it to the Roanoke River uh, and set it up there. And so the new lighthouse um, went on station <clears throat> only a few months after the um, uh, after the fire, they did a remarkable job of getting it back on station in August um, of 1885. Uh, that lighthouse was destroyed in a freak act of nature, I guess you would say again. I'll explain that in just a moment. Uh, the third Roanoke River Lighthouse went on station on August 15th, 1887. It took them a little longer to replace this lighthouse. They didn't have one ready to go like they did after the, the fire destroyed the first one. So it took them a little longer to get this one ready to go. And it went on station on August 15th, 1887. This is the lighthouse um, that was moved to Edenton in the 1950s and now sits on the Edenton waterfront. So what happened to the second Roanoke River Lighthouse? Well, as I said before, original lighthouse destroyed by fire March 21st, uh, 1885. The new lighthouse went on station. The second one went on station August 15th. The winter of 1885-86 was extraordinarily cold. Uh, portions of the, the Roanoke Sound and portions of the lower Roanoke River uh, actually froze over in December, January of 1885-86. There was a period of thawing in around mid-January, uh, <clears throat> and the ice began to break up and came charging out of the river. And on uh, January 17th, I think it was, uh, one of these huge, gigantic chunks of ice hit the base of the Roanoke River Lighthouse and just took it out. Um, you can see an article here from the News and Observer dated January 24th, 1886, uh, describing that event. Um, it says the lighthouse at the mouth of the Roanoke River was overturned by the breaking up of the ice. The keepers were in that house when the ice hit. They went down with it. Uh, miraculously, the structure did not go underwater. The report uh, from the annual the annual report of the Lighthouse Board says that one side of the house was about 18 inches underwater and the other side, the opposite side, was about 18 inches above water. I haven't figured out exactly how the lighthouse hit the water. If it was on one side, one of the walls was on the, wa on the water, or if the deck was on the water, I haven't found a description. Uh, of how it actually hit the water. 
uh, the keepers were rescued by a passing steamship, and that must have been a, a terrifying experience um, for those guys. Um, <clears throat> but uh, as I said, this is where the third Roanoke River Lighthouse came along, the one that is that is now in Edenton. Um, wanted to say a little bit about the um, importance of these little river lighthouses to just day-to-day uh, -day life in uh, eastern North Carolina at that time. You think of lighthouses and you think of the big lighthouses, the big famous lighthouses on the Outer Banks, Cape Hatteras, of course, Currituck, Body Island. Um, uh, these lights uh, were vitally important to ships at sea, passing ships at sea in the sea lanes offshore. But these little Roman, these little river lighthouses there, and as you can see, there were at least 17 of them uh, stretched all along the sounds there. Um, these little river lighthouses were vitally important to the day-to-day -day lives. It was less dramatic, but it was every bit as important to the everyday lives of Eastern North Carolina residents. Um, if you wanted to go anywhere in that North Car in, in that part of North Carolina, in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, there was a good chance you were going to get on a boat to do it. Um, if you were a businessman and you wanted to move a shipment of lumber uh, from Plymouth, where you see Lighthouse Number 1 there, down to New Bern, uh, it went by ship. And once you left, once you cleared the Roanoke River and got into the Albemarle Sound, you were going to be guided by a series, a network of uh, lighthouses there. I, I would dare say that during your journey from Plymouth to, Ro to uh, New Bern, that you would not be out of sight um, as a of, of a lighthouse. Um, so these were, um, none of these lights, well, the Edenton Lighthouse is still there. I guess the Edenton is the last of the original lighthouses but any, this was what eastern this is how eastern north carolina uh especially northeastern north carolina functioned uh 100 125 years ago um so we're going to take a look at some of the the people who staffed those lighthouses uh the clifton family uh were keepers of the roanoke river light stations they maintained that light for a century which is pretty remarkable um, Thomas Clifton, who is the, the gentleman on your left there in uniform, he started his career as an assistant keeper aboard the Roanoke River Light Ship in 1835. And then when the new uh, Roanoke River Lighthouse uh, was uh, put online in 1867, he was appointed keeper of, uh, of that lighthouse. Um, <clears throat> That is his son there to the right, William Benjamin Clifton. Um, Thomas Clifton uh, retired in 1899, and his son, uh, Ben Clifton, took over uh, in 1899 and operated, was in charge of the light until 1933. Uh, the middle photo shows um, Ben Clifton's granddaughter, Judy Clifton Wright. And she is holding a port. She is standing with portraits of her grandfather and great grandfather. Um, Judy has been generous enough to give us a permanent loan of some objects that were in the lighthouse, including uh, that chest there you see behind her. Her grandfather Benjamin Clifton had that aboard the lighthouse uh, when he was keeper there. She has um, since this picture was made. She has also. Uh, given us permanent loan of a rocking chair that was in the lighthouse. And so we have managed to recreate at least a little bit of the ambience uh, in the lighthouse um, at the time um, that it was in use. Um, the Clifton family suffered a great tragedy in 1890 um, when uh, six-year-old Jesse Clifton, who was the son of Thomas Clifton, drowned in the Albemarle Sound. Uh, the youngster went down to one of the lower decks to get uh, firewood and somehow or other fell into the sound and drowned. Um, he, he, he was retrieved by the keepers, but they could not resuscitate him and, uh, and, and he drowned. And his death led to um, some changes in the um, lighthouse, lighthouse service regulations. Keepers 
uh, were were forbidden from having families aboard. Um, William or uh, Ben Clifton didn't pay a lot of attention to that rule, and uh, his uh, Judy, his granddaughter, uh, told me that uh, she had heard a story about one afternoon Ben looked out on the horizon and saw a lighthouse inspector's boat making its way to the lighthouse out on the horizon. And he knew he was going to be in trouble if uh, if the youngster was caught aboard the lighthouse. So he took he took his youngster to a storage cabinet and um, and told him to to climb up on one of the shelves and lie down and just don't say anything. Don't make a sound. And it was during the summer. It was very hot. I imagine it. You, there was a smell of uh, fuel and other uh, chemicals in there. Must not have been a very pleasant place for the for the youngster to stay. Uh, the lighthouse keeper, of course, took his time making the inspection and uh, took a long time. But um, uh, Ben's son uh, did exactly as he was told, and uh, uh, the keeper did not discover that Ben had uh, a family member um, aboard. So he he got away with a little bit there. Um, <clears throat> This is uh, Thomas Quidley, who uh, served in both U.S. Lighthouse Service and later in U.S. Coast Guard when the Coast Guard took over supervision of the lights uh, shortly before World War II. Um, uh, Mr. Quidley, Keeper Quidley, served aboard the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, the Body Island Lighthouse, and the Neuse River Lighthouse. Um, he was renowned for his... Uh, his skills at the at the Neuse River Lighthouse. He was cited for, for bravery, for uh, fighting through ice and snow on rough seas to aid some stranded mariners. He was awarded a Commissioner's Efficiency Star in 1925 in recognition of his work the previous year. And he won awards for keeping the best maintained lighthouse in the 5th District. His son, uh, Dallas Quidley, uh, loaned me these documents to make copies of them. And Dallas uh, talked about what a stickler his, uh, his father was. He said that um, he was aboard the lighthouse with his father one day, and he wanted to go into another room. Um, I'm sorry, he wanted to go out on the deck. And uh, his his father told him, do not go through that door. I've just polished that knob, that brass knob. I do not want any kids' fingerprints on it. Uh, if you want to go out on the deck, you go out through another door. So he was very strict um, uh, and very competent about his work uh, on, on the Neuse River Lighthouse. <clears throat> James Samuel Miller was an assistant keeper um, aboard the Neuse River Lighthouse. And there you see the Neuse River Lighthouse in the, in the picture there. Uh, it's very similar in design to the Roanoke River Lighthouse. And in fact, um, the earliest lighthouses on the, the Roan on the Albemarle Sound were all of this similar design. As I said, there was um, a big depot up in Baltimore where they built these and um, and they used kind of one set of plans for most of the lighthouses. By the time of the third uh, Roanoke River Lighthouse, they had changed their design plan a little bit. And that's why the third Roanoke River Lighthouse looks a little different. Um, but the, the Neuse River Lighthouse, the Wade Point Lighthouse, um, Laurel Point Lighthouse, a lot of these little lights river lighthouses were very similar or identical to this. I love this picture of um, Mr. Miller here with his family. You see the, the little guy uh, to his left there uh, who was in the photograph. Um, he's apparently he's very, very proud of the baseball that he got and uh, wanted to have his baseball be a part of the um, of the photograph. Um, Mr. Miller was uh, served aboard. Uh, th this picture was made around 1910. Mr. Miller served aboard the lighthouse, the Neuse River Lighthouse, until he was disabled by a heart attack in 1918. Um, Mr. Miller's heart attack is another example of, um, of Mr. Quidley's um, um, stellar service. Uh, I've heard a couple of stories about how this event unfolded. 
uh, uh, Keeper Miller was at the lighthouse when he had the heart attack. Uh, Keeper Quidley was ashore. And uh, it was, again, it was one during another one of these very, very cold winters. And I said, I, as I've said, I've heard this. Uh, I haven't found documentation of this, but this is the stories that I have heard. One story is that, um, I mean, it was one of those winters where the sound had frozen over. One of the stories I've heard said that, uh, that Keeper Quidley put Mr. Miller in a boat and towed the boat uh, across the ice, uh, tied a piece of rope to it and threw it over his shoulder and towed it across the ice to get him to, to safety, get him medical attention. Uh, another story that I have heard is that he strapped, uh, Quidley strapped Miller to a rocking chair and lowered him down onto the ice and then pushed the rocking chair sort of like a sled um, across the ice uh, to get him to shore. Uh, Mr. Miller's family and Mr. Miller's descendants have told me those stories. Um, I don't doubt that Keeper Quidley went to extreme lengths to get help for his friend. I uh, don't know which one of those stories is correct, um, but um, but he certainly did um, uh, perform heroically um, that day. Uh, the Jeanette and Dickerson families are two more uh, lighthouse keeping families. Um, <clears throat> the Jeanettes are from Buxton, North Carolina, of course, which of course is where Cape Hatteras is. And these photos of uh, Devaney Jeanette and uh, Kenneth Dickerson were provided for me by uh, Dawn, uh, Dawn Taylor who of, of Buxton, who is descended from a long line of uh, lighthouse keepers. Uh, note the Cape Fear lighthouse uh, photo there in the center of the screen. Um, it was built in uh, 1903 um, on, uh, I believe it was Baldhead Island. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it was demolished in, 18, in 1958 um, after the Oak Island lighthouse uh, uh, went on station. Uh, keeper uh, Devane of uh, keep, Keeper Jeanette there at the left is shown with his grandchildren at the uh, Cape Fear Lighthouse. Uh, he died of a heart attack while on duty at the Cape Fear Lighthouse in um, December of 1932. Uh, Kenneth Dickerson uh, was in the U.S. Navy when he came to Buxton while he was there. He met uh, Keeper Devaney's uh, daughter and eventually married her and entered the lighthouse service. Uh, he was among his duty stations was he was the keeper at uh, Hooper Island Lighthouse in Maryland from 1936 to 1944. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit look at the at the um, bureaucracy that managed uh, the lighthouses. Uh, the U.S., the United States Lighthouse Service. Uh, the spelling of lighthouse has kind of evolved over the years. Uh, when it first came into use in the, I guess this would have probably been post-Civil War, uh, it, was light, it was hyphenated, US, uh, light hyphen house service. Uh, the hyphen was dropped for a while, and it was just two words, lighthouse service, and eventually it became one word. Um, at its peak in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, uh, the Lighthouse Service employed almost 6,000 people, uh, including keepers for more than 500 lighthouses and light ships. Um, it maintained more than 5,000 lighted beacons uh, on the uh, Atlantic coast, uh, the Gulf Coast, Pacific Coast, the Great Lakes, and, and some of the inland rivers. Um, that is something that, I mean, our concept of that, I guess, has just been completely lost um, with, uh, with modern technology. But uh, um, lighting the way for maritime traffic was a, was a very big deal um, at that time. Um, <clears throat> most of the North Carolina lighthouses were part of the 5th Lighthouse District which uh, included uh, the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland and extended south to the New River uh, near Jacksonville, North Carolina. 
the uh, Cape Fear Lighthouse and Bald Head Island Lighthouse that you saw that we were mentioned in the earlier slides uh, were part of the 6th District. Um, the U.S. Lighthouse Service uh, had a depot in Washington, North Carolina, which provided supplies and performed maintenance and repairs for the 5th District Lighthouses uh, around um, the Albemarle Sound. Um, Keeper's duties were, it's, you look at some of the stuff that these guys had to do, and it, it's really, it, it is just remarkable. Uh, long hours, hard work, um, low pay. Uh, I want to read this uh, excerpt from the Lighthouse Keeper's Manual from the 1870 uh, Keeper's Manual. Um, it says, during stormy and thick weather, light keepers are required give their whole time and constant attention to the lights in their charge to keep the flames at their greatest attainable height, burning brightly and steadily. In the lantern glass free inside and outside of moisture during heavy gales of wind, snow, rain, and hailstorms, the lights must never be left unattended by a keeper. That is one difficult charge uh, that these guys uh, had had to live up to. Um, there were, and in addition to that, um, there were other very uh, demanding tasks that they were required to perform every day, uh, such as uh, removing the beacon and cleaning it. Remember, um, electric lighthouses didn't come along until I 20s or 30s, maybe. Um, most of the time that the lighthouse service was in existence, uh, it was a flame light that was um, that was used to light the beacon, and it burned. In the earliest days, it burned whale oil. Uh, later on, uh, late 19th, starting in the late 19th, early 20th century, kerosene became available, and they started burning kerosene. Uh, should have mentioned this earlier. The um, the, be the beacons came in different sizes, different intensities. Um, the beacon at the Roanoke River Lighthouse was a fourth order lighthouse. Uh, it, that means that the beacon could, could have been seen from about 12 or 14 miles from the lighthouse. The big lighthouses on, on the Outer Banks, uh, Cape Hatteras and Body Island and so forth, um, had beacons that could be seen for 20 to 22 miles out to sea. Um, the, the beams were able to be project, projected for these distances thanks to a device called the Fresnel lens, uh, which was manufactured in France. They were very expensive, um, but they were the best uh, lights available for this purpose. Um, <clears throat> If it's hard to describe um, how a Fresnel lens works. It was a series of, of, of crystal glass that uh, that magnified the light uh, repeatedly, and uh, eventually uh, it reached the brightness that was visible um, at such great distances. Um, but uh, for everything that was expected of the lighthouse keepers, they still had, uh, as I said, these, these onerous duties, uh, removing the beacon and cleaning it every day. They had to, to haul fuel up the stairs uh, to refuel the light. Um, the keeper had to know everything from how to repair a marine engine to how to cook on a wood stove. And the pay was just astonishingly low. Um, the keeper of the Roanoke River Lighthouse in the late 19th century, of course, that would have been Thomas Clifton, was paid $560 a year. That's it. Um, in today's, uh, in today's uh, buying power, that's about $11,200. That is not very much. Uh, the keepers in the large light lighthouses on the Outer Banks were paid um, considerably more, but still it was not, uh, not anything resembling uh, a lucrative living. So it really did take a special um, dedicated purpose, a person to handle the duties of a lighthouse keeper. 
Um, kind of like just a little bit more at the, the bureaucracy here. Um, the um, the U.S. Lighthouse Service uh, was a bureaucracy. The U.S. Lighthouse Service was sort of a paramilitary organization in a way. It, it had it was a uniform service uh, that had ranks. Um, and uh, the administration uh, in Baltimore uh, often sent out memos um, uh, reminding keepers of their duties and, and how they were for be, to be performed. The regulations probably uh, seemed excessive and quite annoying at times, but they were necessary to maintain a uniformly high standard of service. Uh, again, these documents uh, were loaned to me by Dallas Quidley for copying. Uh, I just uh, pulled out a few uh, examples of some of the bureaucratic language here. Effective uh, upon re receipt hereof, no release of any information. Uh, requesting articles from the attached list, use Form 95, use Form 36, use Form D. Um, <clears throat> Uh, reports had to be submitted regularly, monthly reports, quarterly reports, annual reports. There was always a report being due. And uh, in the upper right corner there, you see a memo that went out. Um, apparently, the superintendent of lighthouses had visited a station when a photographer was there, and uh, he had seen a couple of his keepers um, slouching around a little bit, maybe not in their proper uniforms. And so he sent out a memo um, telling all keepers to make sure that their uniforms were always properly worn. And when they see, uh, when they saw a um, photographer that they were to maintain, and this is his phrase, an alert and snappy posture. So he did not. He did not want his keepers uh, slouching around and 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 looking like they weren't earning their meager pay. Um, but the you know the the lighthouse service did have a heart, um, so to speak. Um, the Secretary of Commerce did want to um, to uh, acknowledge the employees during the holidays. Um, I'm going to read this brief letter that went out uh, on December 21st, 1914, as a holiday greeting. Uh, the Secretary of Commerce, in a letter to the Commissioner of Lighthouses dated December 21st, 1914, expressed an earnest desire that steps be taken to convey to all employees of the Lighthouse Service his sincere, his sincere wish for a happy new year to them. You are directed to receive this kind greeting from the Secretary of Commerce for yourself and to extend this same to all employees of the service under your charge. Um, so while it was, it was kind of stiff, uh, at least uh, the Secretary of Commerce and the Commissioner of Lighthouses uh, did make some effort to uh, wish their employees uh, season's greetings, um, so to speak. But with the uh, advance of technology, of course, um, pretty much inevitable that that this kind of uh, of uh, lifestyle was was going to come to an end. Um, after the turn of the twentieth century, lighthouses were gradually electrified. And, automate, and automated, and that auto, uh, automation meant that full-time keepers were no longer needed. Uh, also, the U.S. Lighthouse Service was absorbed by the U.S. Coast Guard in the early 1940s. And by 1935, which was exactly 100 years after the Roanoke Light River Lighthouse went on station, uh, only three of those little lighthouses in the Albemarle Sound were still manned by resident keepers. The other lights had been had been automated or replaced in some way. Um, the Elizabeth City Independent, a newspaper in Elizabeth City, um, commented on, on this in, in its edition of January 18th, 1935. Um, <clears throat> It noted that the great array of lighthouses that dotted the sounds a few years ago 
standing guard over the waterways and protecting the lives and cargoes that moved up and down our waterways, uh, they noted that that, that was, was disappearing. Um, Wayne Wheeler, uh, the founder of the U.S. Lighthouse Service, uh, Lighthouse Society, I'm sorry, uh, founder of the U.S. Lighthouse Society, uh, expressed the sadness of the lighthouses in a, in a, a, a statement that I thought was very eloquent. Um, as our civilization progressive, progresses, we move two steps forward and sometimes one step backwards, ebb and flow. Progress continues, but for us, a quaint, unique, and altruistic way of life has passed over the horizon. Um, altruistic, I mean, putting the welfare of many ahead of your own, uh, that, I think, uh, was the essence of the Lighthouse Keeper's character. It's what set them apart from most people. Um, it's what made them uh, ordinary, everyday heroes, uh, the same kind of people who are firefighters and nurses and cops and paramedics. Um, and uh, they made a major contribution to keeping um, our society moving uh, at that time. And um, so, I mean, there's for better or worse, there's always going to be progress. Um, but it is a bit saddening that uh, we often don't see this kind of altruism on display the way we once did. So that concludes my presentation. Before I leave you, uh, I would like to uh, remind you that um, the, the uh, famous Plymouth Bear Festival is coming up in Plymouth. Uh, I believe it's the first weekend in June. Uh, this is a fabulous festival that's, uh, I think this is fourth or fifth year. I'm not, I'm not sure. Anyway, it's continually winning awards as one of the best small festivals in the state. Um, it's based on uh, plum the presence of so many large black bears in that part of North Carolina. Uh, the Roanoke River Lighthouse, I think, will be open without charge at that time. That's what we did last year. And we had a great turnout. Uh, we are the Roanoke River Lighthouse and Maritime Museum is also working on a special exhibit um, that will be presented at the Roanoke at, at the museum uh, in time for the Bear Festival and will remain there for the rest of the summer. I don't want to talk about it until we get a little bit farther along with it, but it is going to happen, and I think it's going to be. Uh, a very unusual and engaging exhibit. So hope you all come see us at the Roanoke River Lighthouse. And thanks a lot for your attention. I enjoyed it. And I'll be glad to um, glad to try to respond to any questions if anybody if anybody has any questions. First of all, thank you, Willie. That was that was really excellent. I learned a, quite a few things and I hope everybody else did too. Um, if you would like to unmute yourselves and ask questions or make comments, please, please do so. Anyone? I have a question. Please. Hi, Willie. How are you? I'm doing well. Hope you are. That was a wonderful, 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 well-researched, very thorough presentation. The graphics were excellent. Good Thank job. you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Good job. Can I hire you? Um, sure. Yeah, let me talk to my wife, but uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I can't afford you. So I, I, you'd, be, you'd, you'd be surprised. <laughs> I'm curious, uh, you know, that you said that um, I, I never knew this. You know, I have um, Bruce and Cheryl's wonderful uh, lighthouse map that they did many, many years ago. And it shows many of the uh, uh, screw pile uh, lighthouses in the sound that you, that you showed your map of, which was very thorough. I think you showed 17 of them. And um, you said that there was a, a, a depot in Baltimore where they built these. Well, yes, how, sir. The heck, how the heck did they get them down here? They put them on barges and towed them down here. Um, wow. That's that is, I mean, that's documented by the annual reports of the U.S. Lighthouse Service. Um, there was a, a depot at Lazaretto Point, I believe it was called. And um, 
when they were replacing, when they were when they were putting up the third Roanoke River Lighthouse, the description in the annual report, the Lighthouse Service annual report, said that the building was framed out at Lazaretto and then brought down to uh, its station point. And they brought other materials down um, and unloaded them at Edenton and I guess went back and forth between Edenton and the Roanoke River as they needed them. But, I mean, they were capable of uh, some heavy engineering and, and heavy uh, movement of heavy objects at that time, not, not anything like we are today. But uh, it is surprising when you when you look into some of this stuff at what they were able to do with the equipment that they had available at the time. Um, but as I said, I mean, that's documented by the uh, annual report of the U.S. Lighthouse Service. Um, and and the, 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 the uh, memos from the keepers that I showed earlier also came out of Baltimore. So that, that's how that worked. That, of course, all would have come through the Albemarle Chesapeake Canal and, and the Intercoastal Waterway, right? Well, but they did have telegraphs in those days. Um, yeah, but it, yeah, the, the 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 paperwork, I guess, would have probably moved that way. I would think because the the uh, Dismal Swamp Canal was still in extensive use um, at that time. Okay. Um, the, the only other question I have is. I did not know you mentioned that there was a fifth district depot in Washington, North Carolina. Yes, sir. Um, if you're familiar with uh, coming into uh, Washington, um, as you cross the bridge coming from Chocowinity, and you're almost across the bridge and you look to your right there as, as you cross the bridge, um, that is my understanding is that where that is where the Lighthouse Depot was. And they had um, a couple of lighthouse tenders, ships that were uh, operated out of that depot that delivered food and firewood and uh, fuel and other supplies, uh, kind of made the rounds in the 5th District. Those, the lighthouse tenders that worked out of Washington, I don't think went out of the Albemarle Sound region. Uh, the other lighthouses farther north in Virginia and Maryland uh, were serviced by similar depots um, up there. But um, yeah, there was a there was a depot that that depot was mentioned a time or two in some of the U.S. Lighthouse Service documents that that I have seen. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to talk to you more about that in the future, but I'll let other people ask their questions. Well, feel free to email me anytime you like, John. Um, Willie.dry at gmail.com. Yeah, I've got um, And I, I will I will try to respond as quickly as I can. I am having to do a lot having to do a lot of travel for this book project, but uh, but I will respond to it as quickly as I can. And I'll be I glad appreciate it, Willie. A, a great presentation. So do Thank you stay you. in Plymouth in Plymouth now or in Wilmington? We we live in uh, Wilmington. We have maintained our residence in Plymouth. We've got an old 1870 vintage coastal cottage up there that I love, and um, my wife is indulgent enough to uh, to uh, let us uh, hold on to it. And uh, I do have regular projects and so forth in Plymouth that takes me up there. So uh, I, I love it when I get a chance to go up there and stay in this old house. Okay, thank you again. You're welcome. Glad you enjoyed it. You guys are going to let me off easy. <laughs> I, I have been for a long time quite aware of the Washington Depot, and I've wanted to do an article on it. I've been keeping notes. John, there are several mentions throughout all the uh, Lighthouse Bulletins about the Washington Depot. Right. And it was even involved with that uh, the move of the Hatteras lens. Um, I think I've heard that. Yes. Yes. Yeah, the Taylor, Dr. Taylor, and that family, the Taylor, T A Y L O, uh, excuse me, yeah. T A Y L O E. Yeah. yeah, that's the very well known family in Washington. In fact, they were druggists there for many, many years. They ran pharmacies, or at least one pharmacy in Washington for many, many years. He was involved with that 
mix up with the lens at Cape Hatteras. I don't know whether he was a red herring or set up as a decoy <laughs> or what, but he but he was involved. And we have I've got copies of his letters. Oh really? Mm -hmm. But interesting. And that I, I would love to see copies of those letters sometimes if you if you wouldn't mind. In fact, I'd, I'd love to make them part of our collection at the Roanoke River Lighthouse and Maritime Museum. One of the things that I hope to accomplish is is to make um, is to make that uh, museum sort of a repository for information about these little river lighthouses because I don't think there's anything like that out there. I haven't come across anything uh like that yet and i think that is one way that we could sort of set ourselves apart um as a museum is to uh have a repository of documents and i've got a lot of stuff that i didn't even mention in this presentation i've got copies of uh lighthouse inspection reports from for the roanoke river lighthouse and uh, the wade point lighthouse i believe uh, they had to undergo inspections every so often, and the inspector would uh, fill out a form describing how well the lighthouse was maintained and describing the lighthouse and a lot of details about the lights. Um, and these documents, uh, I dug these docu documents up years ago at uh, the National Archives in Washington. Uh, they were part of the Coast Guard archives, if I remember correctly. but. Uh, yeah, I, I would like very much to talk to you about that uh, when, when we get an opportunity. Please, uh, uh, I'd be grateful if you'd send me an email at the address that I just gave John, willie.dry. I have it. I, okay, good. Yeah, yeah, and okay. I would like to say that I can just walk over to uh, my paper files and pull them out. But um, I mean, I'm very organized with my digital files, but I have got bins full of copies of documents that we got at the National Archives and picked up along mm. the way. So maybe you could come here and just do a little archaeological dig. <laughs> well, <laughs> that would be uh, when I when I can find time to do it. Um, uh, I've got to go up to New York in the near future for more book research. But when, when I get an opportunity, uh, I would like very much to do that. And I appreciate the offer. Thanks, William. It was a good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very glad you enjoyed it. I appreciate your saying that. Anyone else? I have a question. Um, somebody that I know is getting ready to move to South Carolina. And I think they have family members in North Carolina. And something was mentioned at the last get together that the Roanoke, uh, that they bought a lighthouse and it was Roanoke. Does anybody have any information on that? Or one they of their bought. kids bought it. Now, so, you know, I would think you would know. Well, the only thing that comes to mind, um, I believe I mentioned earlier that the third Roanoke River Lighthouse was decommissioned um, and it was eventually uh, put up for, for sale uh, for $10, I think it was sometime in the 1950s. And um, an Edenton resident who was also a marine engineer, very clever and daring marine engineer uh, named Emmett Wiggins, I believe was his name, uh, bought the lighthouse and figured out a way to get it aboard a barge and towed it over to Edenton uh, and set it up on shore there and lived in it until his death around 03 or 04, I think. The original intent of Plymouth was to uh, buy that lighthouse from Mr. Wiggins and move it across the sound and refurbish it in Plymouth. Um, and that deal was in the works. Um, but um, Mr. Wiggins died and uh, the, the negotiations, the discussion sort of broke down after his death and uh, his heirs uh, ended up selling it, I think, to the town of Edenton. And uh, that's when it was moved um, 
to uh, the waterfront and refurbished. And um, after the deal with the um, uh, 1887 Roanoke River Lighthouse uh, was not consummated, uh, the town of Plymouth and uh, some other agencies got funding from the state of North Carolina, the Department of Transportation, from Weyerhaeuser, from the town of Plymouth, and some other agencies and raised enough money to build uh, an exact replica of the Roanoke, the 1867 Roanoke River Lighthouse that you see there on the waterfront now. And that, to my understanding, is what happened um, with the lighthouse. You mentioned uh, the Roanoke River Lighthouse being sold. That's the only thing I'm aware of along those lines. But this uh, is just recently, I think. So I I don't know. Well, I don't know. They didn't buy the lighthouse in Plymouth that's there now. I know I know that. Uh, <laughs> I don't know about the lighthouse in Edenton. Um, I, my understanding was that the town of Edenton owned that. That may not be correct though. But uh, there there are no other lighthouses. Let's see. There's one in Manio which is a reproduction of, I can't remember if it's Crotan Lighthouse or the Roanoke Marshes. Marshes, it's the Marshes Light. Um, but I'm not aware of any other lighthouse that they could have bought. Um, okay. And not they, recently, Bill Tate was involved in those, um, at the same time that the Roanoke River Light was gotten by Emmett. In fact, Emmett Wiggins got involved because Bill Tate had lost two of the uh, river lights overboard and it went out and saved one of them yeah the the uh, wade point lighthouse um mm -hmm. was uh they got it onto a barge but somehow didn't get it properly stabilized or maybe they just had some bad luck i don't know but the barge overturned and the wade point lighthouse that's the one up around elizabeth city or was up around elizabeth city got dumped into the sound um, and I, there may have been another one that they lost. I can't remember which one that was. The Laurel Point. It may, was, it may have been Laurel Point. I don't remember. But, yeah, I do believe that there were two lighthouses that were dumped into the sound when, uh, when people tried to move them. And the story that I heard was that, as I said, that Mr. Wiggins was a very clever and a very daring engineer and he figured out a way to do it and nobody thought that he could do it they just figured they were going to see another lighthouse go into the sound uh, but mr wiggins was able to get it on a barge and get it over to edenton and and get it set up but um <clears throat> I, I don't know the fate of all of the other um little lighthouses other than the fact that they aren't there anymore um wanted to do a presentation i wanted to mention the forbes family who um who were keepers of the uh wade point lighthouse i thought i had some pictures of uh of uh was it willard forbes or was anyway it was a mr forbes who was the lighthouse keeper at wade point for many years i know that we have a picture a painting of the Wade Point Lighthouse at the Lighthouse and Museum in Plymouth, and we have a picture of Mr. Forbes um, when he was the keeper. Um, I I talked to his son or grandson, did an interview with him. He he was a very interesting and helpful uh, gentleman. Uh, he remembered being aboard the Wade Point Lighthouse, and he, he commented that it looked exactly like the uh, Roanoke River Lighthouse when he came to the, when he entered the Roanoke River Lighthouse replica for the first time, I could just see him, I could almost see the years flashing in front of his eyes there because he was saying, my goodness, this is, you know, this is just like being back aboard the Wade Point Lighthouse. Uh, but I'm sorry, I'm starting to ramble a little bit here. But, uh, <laughs> hey, I have a painting by Willard Forbes of the lighthouse. Well, that um, may be, we may have a copy of that in ours lighthouse. Okay. We have something there, yeah. I, I thought I would try to get it off my wall and bring it over and show it to you, but um, it's too big and I can't get to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't, wouldn't want you to damage it, but um, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but well, yeah, Mr. I yes, 
Are you aware that the Outer Banks Lighthouse Society got the original drawings for uh, the lighthouses in Plymouth Town, 1866? No, I didn't know that. I didn't know yes, that. I know that. Yes. I know that. He, uh, he and uh, Harry Thomas, when, that, when they were first. Dower uh, Jones uh, was involved and Har Harry Thomas, Thompson. Uh, Harry Thompson. Thompson, I think. Yeah. Yeah, the um, Railroad Museum. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the well, yeah, the the museum that's in the old railroad station. It's uh, uh, it's, it's well, we're trying to do something about that. Um, we have they have hired a new curator there who is very knowledgeable, and uh, um, so some work is trying to be done on that, maybe to expand the scope of its uh, mission a little bit. I'm not on that board, so I don't really know for sure, but uh, um, I do know that they are trying to make some changes there um, as well. Joyce, did you have a question? Uh, it was slightly off topic, but uh, in 1994, my husband and I stayed at a lighthouse it was called Big Bay Point Lighthouse. It was in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Hmm. And we stayed overnight and we, were, we got little stickers that said honorary lighthouse keeper. <laughs> and we went upstairs at night and met another couple. And the four of us stood around the rim of the light and talked and had a conversation. And I think that was our love, the beginning of our love of lighthouses. <laughs> so mm -hmm. It was really, really, it was really cool. And my husband had found this brochure, he keeps everything. And he said, look, we can stay in this lighthouse. And I said, this brochure is seven years old. This is when you did brochures. And I said, it's seven years old. And we called them and it was different people that owned it, but it was set up as a bed and breakfast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we did what? that. And now we've been to um, the Outer Banks over, I have a North Carolina shirt on, but we've been to the Outer Banks over a dozen times. We visited the five major, including Cape Lookout lighthouses. Mm -hmm. we've, we've walked Hatteras many times. We've walked Currituck. I mean, we love the Outer Banks. Um, so I think that our first visit in 1994 for our 10 year anniversary <laughs> became our love of lighthouses. So mm -hmm. lighthouse, well, you should uh, you should check out the inner banks sometimes and, and come to Plymouth and, and check out our little lighthouse there. Uh, you, you might enjoy it. It's um, uh, if I do say so myself, it's very well done. Um, we recently tried to spiff it up a little bit, uh, clean up the exterior, and I believe the next um, the next objective is to get a new paint job on it. I mean, it's it, it still looks good, but you need to do that every once in a while, just as a you know kind of standard procedure. The Outer Banks Lighthouse Society had um, a project one spring many years ago, and that was to scrape the paint off of um, parts of the. Roanoke River Lighthouse in Plymouth so that it could be repainted. So um, that was a lot well, of fun. I'm not yeah, sure well, that we were a lot younger then. I don't know that we're up to well, I was going up say, there to scrape you know, paint. <laughs> I, I, I was going to say, if y'all are looking for a project, <laughs> you know, I, I can put you to work. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, Does anyone else have a comment or question for Willie? Then um, let's wrap it up. It's been a wonderful afternoon. Willie, thank you so much for being with us and sharing your knowledge of the, not just the Roanoke River Lighthouse, but of all of them. We really do appreciate your being here and um, looking forward maybe to seeing you in October. And if not, then reading your new book when it comes out. That'll be sometime in 2024. I have been given permission to talk about it. Um, it is a biography of Henry Flagler, who was uh, most people, it's a very familiar name in Florida. You get outside of Florida, uh, people aren't as familiar with it. Henry Flagler was John D. Rockefeller's business partner. And John D. Rockefeller always gave Flagler credit for making the gigantic mountain of money that they made at Standard Oil Company. And um, my agent and I got this uh this assignment uh, last year, and um, the editors want me to have it ready to hit the bookstores in 2024. Um, so that's what I'm working on now. I've been down to Florida a couple of times. I've been up to uh, Pennsylvania to 
do some research in the oil country up there. I've got to go to New York and Cleveland, but so I'm going to be kind of busy, but um, um, I'll keep you posted on that and uh, would be glad to sign a copy for you when it comes out. All right. Thank you. Thank everyone um, for being here.